We return to a topic we looked at before, the distribution of income. We do this partly because it's such an important issue in social science, but also because it enables us to review a number of statistical topics that we've met earlier in the series. In a previous film, we looked at the difference between wealth and income. If we plot the data for either of these variables, for most countries, we get a positively skewed distribution. Wealth is even more skewed than income, with most people having little or no wealth at all. And the distribution of incomes is a skewed distribution. There are lots of people who don't earn very much. There are quite a few people in the middle, and there are a very small number of people who earn an extraordinarily large amount of money. Now, if you choose to analyse that by taking a mean, you're going to end up with a rather high number, simply because a few billionaires can distort it. And you present that as an average. The average income in Britain is, you know, what is 50, 60,000. People say, well, hang on a minute. There's not many people. I don't know anyone who gets that. And that's a classic case where you really should be looking at either the median or the mode. If you want to know, so what does a typical person in Britain earn? You want the mode. And that is a surprisingly low number. If we want to measure the degree of skewness of wealth, we can do so with a simple formula. But we'll need to be clear about the terms mean, median and standard deviation that we met in earlier films. But with that understanding, we can now develop a measure of how skewed wealth distribution is. The Pearsonian coefficient of skewness, SK, is given as 3 times mean minus median over the standard deviation. A symmetrical distribution will give a value of SK of 0, and in general SK will fall between plus 3 and minus 3. So with a mean wealth of 5,000, a median wealth of 4,500, and a standard deviation of a thousand, we have SK equals three times 5,000 minus 4,500 over 1,000 equals 1,500 over 1,000 gives us 1.5. So we can measure the degree of skewness with a quite limited amount of data. Is there a right distribution of income? Most of us would say it depends upon your view of justice. To some people, justice means that people receive an income which reflects their needs. So if that means redistributing income via the tax system, so be it. To others, justice means receiving an income according to what you produce. In which case, any redistribution of income is by its nature unjust. Denmark, like many European nations, has a very generous system of wealth redistribution. Single mothers, for instance, receive, among other things, housing, health care, dental care and a stipend. The health care, is that free? That is free. We have a dentist. That's also for free. In that way, it's a nice thing, and a really good thing. It's a good deed, if you can say it that way. But even in the most egalitarian European societies, some worry about the effect that taxes have on incentives to work. Well, it's different societies and it's different lifestyles and, uh, of course, uh, different values. Well, we need to have tax to have a foundation for our healthcare system, and ba basic, uh, what should I say, to our wealth. But uh, it's also important that people who work can Get, feel that it's um, worth to work. The tax shouldn't be too high. And I don't think it's right that we have so high taxes as we have in Sweden. But I also think here is an awareness in Sweden that we have the education, we have the healthcare, we have the structure in the society. And I think that's also something that we are all very proud of in Sweden. We, we don't want to get out of uh, social welfare. Compared with European societies, the United States redistributes much less income. Although there are some poverty alleviation programs, 
Americans tend to believe in self-reliance. The homeless, for instance, must rely on the generosity of others. People see a problem and they take it upon themselves to try to address it as opposed to trying to force the government entities to, to deal with the issue. And that's how the shelter got started. Some citizens saw the need and decided to, to make it happen. And I think that's, that's the genesis for a lot of human service agencies. The Shelter for the Homeless received 75% of its funding from private donations. The, the way the United States is set up is that part of the safety net system is provided by private for providers like the shelter. We are a private 501c3. You know, we're not part of, of any governmental agency. It's very different than if you're in Sweden or in France where the government has taken on the role of providing that safety net in, in totality. The, the government in the United States does a lot, but it's, it's not the comprehensive uh, approach that is used in European countries. If we weren't here doing it, the government's not picking up the work, so it has to re rely on private uh, nonprofits or just concerned individuals who are going to go out and, and do the work. Redistributing income will mean taxing people who may then decide it isn't worth working. They take more leisure instead, produce less, and society is poorer. That's why some are so keen on the idea of the Laffer Curve. What's the relationship between the tax rate and the amount of government revenue received? Art Laffer was an American economist and he was sitting in a cocktail bar like this one day talking to the economic advisor to the president during a recession and he was asked what should we do about tax rates and Art Laffer said you should cut them and he explained it like this he pushed his drink aside took a cocktail napkin and drew a diagram which has become the stuff of economic textbooks he said if you plot the tax rate along here from zero to a hundred percent and the tax take up here and you set a zero rate of tax the government gets no revenue if you raise the tax rate government revenue increases but soon the disincentive effects of increasing taxes causes people to work less hard and the government begins to receive less revenue till when you reach a hundred percent tax rate nobody does anything and government revenue is reduced to zero and the diagram which we've just drawn is now in many textbooks and explains why in the Laffer view using the Laffer curve it's often a good idea for governments not to increase taxes but to decrease them what is true of taxes on labor is in principle true of taxes on profits as well. A profits tax is likely to reduce investment demand. If there's less investment, there's less profits. If there's less profits, there's less government revenue. Let's have a look at some data to see if we can see how true this is. Brill and Hassett used non-linear regression methods to test the Laffer curve relationship for corporate taxes. Is there a rate at which increases in business taxes have such a disincentive effect that government revenue declines? They tested this question by looking at 29 OECD countries in two separate periods. The earlier period, 1985 to 1989, a Laffer curve relationship is evident with a peak at a tax rate of around 34%. The tax data is lagged five years because it takes some time for companies to alter investment plans when tax rates change. Now look at the period 2000 to 2005, where a relationship still holds but the inflection point is now lower at around 28%. Notice also that the curve is flatter for the earlier period so that the cost in lost government revenue is greater for having rates above the peak. Capital has become more mobile between countries over time, so this result is unsurprising. 
But how good a fit is the data? We'll give just a few of their results. The first column shows the results for all countries looked at. The second, when they've excluded outlier countries, countries that are unusual for various reasons. And excluding these countries makes little difference to the results. As you can see from the table, the R squared is quite low, but the tax coefficient is significant not just at the 5% level, perhaps the most common choice of significance level for regression analysis, but at the 1% level. So there's important evidence about the robustness of the Laffer curve concept because regression analysis can handle non-linear relationships as well as linear ones. Let's look at some statistical analysis which was undertaken with some considerable care and see what happens to the distribution of income when mean average incomes are falling during a recession. When such a crisis comes to an economy, while average incomes fall, it's the poor who do relatively badly. We can see this particularly with reference to the USA. The figure plots data over time for various percentiles in household earnings in the USA. The blue shaded areas are periods of recession in the economy. It doesn't show all income, it's only income from labour. And those at the bottom of the distribution get help from unemployment benefits and other transfers, which tend to rise in a recession. Help not shown in this data. In the figure, we've taken the data and divided for each year, each percentile's observation by the data for the first year of the analysis, 1967. This normalization procedure means that all groups would begin with a number of one. But here, we've taken the logarithms of the series. Remember that the log of 1 is 0, so that the starting point is 0. Now we can observe what happens over time to the distribution between groups. Notice in particular how households in the bottom percentiles experience the biggest relative falls during a recession. These declines can be persistent. The lowest percentile's earnings fell 20% in the recession of the early 80s and only returned to pre-recession levels almost two decades later. The data is log-normalised to enable us to see in the graph the proportionate changes between the percentiles over time rather than absolute changes. Now, labour earnings are not the only source of income for households. In particular, at the bottom of the earnings distribution, Governments and private transfers, such as unemployment insurance and so on, tends to rise when earnings fall, thereby mitigating widening earnings inequality. One issue that society has to grapple with is whether to worry about the distribution of income or only to concern itself with the poor. They're not the same thing. Let me show you how. In several previous films, I introduced you to my desert island economy. In one of those films, three of us worked and exchanged and produced income, though it wasn't evenly distributed. We worked at a Gini coefficient to give us a value for the evenness or otherwise of our income distribution. Now, here's another small island economy with which we trade. It also has a total income of 100 euros, also has three people, but the income is shared out differently. The table shows our island and how the two societies' weekly income is distributed. If you wish, you can go back to film 15, calculate the Gini coefficient for the other island, and establish that it's more evenly divided. With the formula we used in an earlier film, we find our island has a coefficient of 26.67, the other island has a coefficient of 16.67. You may recall that the closer to one is the coefficient, the more evenly income is distributed. But now look at the poorest member in each of the two societies. Observe that on our island, our poorest member, member three, has a 25% higher income than on the other island where income is more evenly distributed. 
income distribution and poverty are closely linked, but they are distinct issues. This phenomenon of, of both the income and wealth bifurcation that's going on in our country, personally, I don't think it's sustainable. I, I think we're headed down a path that is going to lead to some real severe problems. People have argued forever about what constitutes a fair distribution of income. We haven't been able to resolve this issue. Probably no one ever will. But if we understand the statistics, at least we're better informed to make our own value judgments. Statistics unlock your ideas. If you um, look through, uh, for instance, the most recent poverty figures, and you're trying to understand what it is that your policy solutions might be to the problems that we have with regards to poverty in this country at the moment, without understanding the figures, without really looking at the numbers, you, you could come up with entirely the wrong solution to the problem. We are uh, bombarded with data of all types, much of it used recklessly. And people quote statistics, it makes no sense. It frustrates me enormously. And I hear people saying something, I say, that's possibly true. I mean, to have a feeling about data, how to analyze data, I think everybody has to do that. And therefore, statistics, and a course in statistics, is the best foundation for getting some appreciation of how to go about doing that.